Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Braithwaite, and I am Head of Skills and Engagement at the Reading Agency. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Teachers Reading Challenge Autumn event, which is all about reinvigorating reading for pleasure in your school or library this autumn. We have a brilliant panel of experts for you this afternoon. I'm joined by Dr. Helen Hendry from The Open University, book reviewer and editor and former teacher and lecturer Joe Bowers, and award-winning authors Elle McNichol and Sue Chung. As some of you may know, author Phil Earle was due to be joining us today too, but unfortunately he's unwell. Uh, I know he's disappointed to miss the event and we send him our best wishes for a really speedy recovery. So this afternoon, we'll hear from each of our panellists in turn on different topics related to reading for pleasure, followed by a group discussion. And at the end of the session, there'll be time for you to ask them some questions. So to do this, you just use the Q&A function, uh, which you should be able to see at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, and if your question is for a particular panellist, make sure you include their name in the message. Uh, the chat function is also enabled, so do say hello on there and tell us where you're joining from today. Uh, we always love to hear where, where everyone is from across the country. So we're going to be recording today's event and it will be available on YouTube so you can watch again later or share with your friends and colleagues. So to kick us off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Teachers Reading Challenge. Uh, I know lots of you here will already be taking part, uh, which is brilliant, but in case you haven't started yet, uh, the Teachers Reading Challenge is an online programme co-created by the Reading Agency and the Open University. And the challenge is for anyone interested in growing their knowledge of contemporary children's books and reading for pleasure pedagogy. Now that could be teachers, TAs, school librarians, absolutely anyone who supports children with their reading. So you can go to the dedicated website to find out how to take part and that's teachersreadingchallenge.org.uk. So when you're there you can set your own reading goal, you can upload book reviews and access thousands of reviews from other users, you can share best practice uh, and access loads of brilliant resources and blogs. Uh, and most importantly, you'll join a really supportive community of educators and readers. Uh, it may be that you've already got a really good knowledge of children's books. Uh, and if that's the case, we'd encourage you to you know, push outside your comfort zone. So perhaps deepen your knowledge of a particular genre that's less familiar to you, maybe, or get to know some debut authors. Uh, so anything to broaden your repertoire of recommendations for the young people you work with. Uh, the challenge runs until the 29th of October, so there's still loads of time to take part. Uh, so do sign up for the challenge if you haven't already. Uh, so we've got loads of exciting people to talk to today, so I'm, I'm going to be quiet now and we're going to crack on with the main part of the session and I'm going to pass to our first panellist. So uh, Dr Helen Hendry is a former teacher and teacher trainer and is currently co-director of the Centre for Literacy and Social Justice and lecturer in primary education at the Open University, as well as a co-creator of the Teachers Reading Challenge uh, alongside Professor Teresa Kremin and the Reading Agency. Uh, so lovely to have you here, Helen. Uh, over to you. Hi, thank you, Emma, and, and welcome to everybody. I'm going to share my screen with just a, a few slides to give you something to look at and also to keep me on track for my um, little section that I've got to introduce some of the thinking behind um, the teachers reading challenge so um, just bear with me while I share and make it into a nice slideshow for you to look at while I'm talking. Okay so the reason why the Open University got involved in setting up the Teachers Reading Challenge with the Reading Agency is because of the wide research base that shows us that teachers, librarians, teaching assistants and other adults working with children um, can really make a difference to children's motivation to read if they extend their own repertoire of reading uh, around different children's texts. So um, one of the important pieces of work that was carried out by my colleague Professor Teresa Kremin worked over two years with um, five different um, regions in the UK and teachers uh, in different schools in those regions looking at what made a difference to how they were able to support their children's um, enthusiasm about reading and um, embed that as pedagogy in their classrooms. 
Uh, and what they found was the more that teachers read, and um, we know this also applies to the teaching assistants and um, I'm sure the librarians too, the more they read around children's text, the more confident they become became to um, talk about their reading um, and share it in maybe a different way to how we traditionally imagine teachers talking about reading. Um, they were able to create what we describe as reciprocal relationships with children uh, where they were sharing their likes and dislikes, talking about when they read, what they read, and really modelling that kind of open, informal book talk around text, which in turn empowered the children they were working with to start talking about that themselves. In doing that, the teachers also started to talk with each other and create this kind of uh, reading community in their schools to share um, recommendations and to, to pick particular texts that would inspire different children, getting to know the, the children's um, interests in the class and really tailoring reading recommendations. Again, really important in encouraging um, children to want to read. Um, it's important if you're getting involved in the teachers reading challenge to understand that we know that that teachers and other adults working with children are really busy people and you can't know everything that's out there in the world of reading but just gradually building up your repertoire um, a little step at a time should build your confidence um, and your ability to inspire uh, children and use reading for different purposes uh, in the way that you work with um, children young people and families if you're interested in the OU research, there is a website that you can access, OURFP.org, um, which has a lot more about how those um, recommendations came about from the work with the teachers and how to put those into practice. So the second thing I wanted to encourage you to think about today um, is the diversity uh, in the text that you read. So that variety of reading, whether you're accessing a range of graphic novels, poetry, nonfiction or hybrid texts, um, again, broadening that repertoire and reading outside of your normal comfort, comfort zone can help you to find things that might intrigue and inspire the young readers that you're, you're working with. Um, I myself, uh, I'm Traditionally, I, in the past, I've been a key stage one and foundation stage teacher, and so I tend to choose picture fiction. But in my work with other schools, I've started to read graphic novels, and I find um, I found some really wonderful ones that I really enjoyed. I'm, I'm waving at you when stars are scattered, which is a fascinating story um, that's um, written by Victoria Jameson and Omar Mohammed um, about Omar's life in a refugee camp. And I don't think that's something I would ever have explored unless I've been challenging myself to read diverse texts, graphic novels that I hadn't really tried before. Um, there's also the need to think about the diversity and representation in the text that you're reading um, and that might be anything from the location where the um, story is set, the home circumstances and the family makeup in the text, but also who wrote the story, who illustrated it, are they representing um, different ethnic groups, Are they? is your story or um, poetry written by a local author or even translated from another language? Again, another favourite I've picked up last year is called um, Poems the Wind Blew In by Carmelo C. Iribarren and that's translated from um, uh, originally a Spanish text for um, children but it's got lovely um, poems about weather and looking out of your window and things that everybody can um, relate to and the importance of this is also backed up a lot of you will be familiar with the CLPE research about um, ensuring there's representation of children from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds in texts. And more often than not, they're not lead characters in the text that you're picking. So it's really good to find um, texts where those uh, children are the, the star of the show. And this is another lovely one called Look up by Nathan Bryan Adapo Adiola, where Rocket is um, this little girl on the front and she's the star of the show. It's all about her interest in space and her relationship with her brother. My last um, thing to share with you is to think about the social nature of reading for pleasure. And again, our research at the OU, but also 
research from other researchers internationally bears out the importance of building social relationships to support children to want to read. And in um, Neu Neubauer and Gilmore's research um, with adolescents, actually, they found that uh, the thing that made the difference was having the opportunity to have personal interactions with children around reading. So that might be one to one conversations or little groups. Um, and so that really sparked the interest in those children because, again, they were talking to their teacher or their teaching assistant or their librarian about their favourite reads. And the last thing to think about related to that is that children don't automatically know how to talk socially around reading. So we need to support them. And again, Teresa Kremin and other colleagues at the OU found that um, when teachers built their confidence from this wider reading repertoire, they were able to support children to um, get engaged socially with teachers and each other around their reading, all forming this brilliant foundation to encourage children to be readers and to want to talk and share their reading. OK, I'm going to stop sharing now, but uh, I will be back in a little while and I think I'm handing over to Joe. Thank you, Helen. That was brilliant. And um, I think that, that social element is really interesting, isn't it? Because I know for Teachers Reading Challenge, we've got posters and various things that, that uh, school staff can put up on the walls so that um, maybe children can give recommendations of what they want their teachers yeah. to read. Or if the kids have done the summer reading challenge themselves over the summer, it's a good way to sort of start chatting about reading, isn't it? If you're both both doing these different challenges. Yeah, that'd be great, Emma. And that's one of the reasons we built some of those things in. Thank you for thank you for reminding me. <laughs> that's something I did want to say, but it's there as part of the challenge to encourage those social interactions, which is so important. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. So we'll, we'll talk to you again soon. Uh, so now over to our, our second panellist. Uh, so Su Chung is a children's author and illustrator and has written picture books, middle grade and YA, uh, including her book Chinglish, which won the National Diverse Book Award and was nominated for the Silip Carnegie Medal. Uh, hi, Su. Over to you. Hi there, thank you very much. And as you can see, I am not Phil Earl, so sorry for the disappointment if some of you are expecting him today. You've got the pleasure of putting up with me instead. So, um, as you heard in the intro, I started off um, as an illustrator and um, I did picture books, and then I've written a YA novel. And um, But I've gone back to my first love, which is um, uh, of comics. Um, so that's why I created these books, Mariette which I'll talk a bit about today. So when I was a kid, we didn't have any books in the house at all. So my parents ran a restaurant and they were really busy. They weren't really concerned or um, didn't encourage reading at all for the kids. And uh, we had no access to a library or anything like that either. And that, so back in the seventies, we were latchkey kids. So we'd get home, there'd be no one in the house. Uh, we'd be left a bit, little bit of money to go and buy our tea with. So obviously if you're a kid, you've got some money, you go to the news agent, you buy pop, crisps and all that kind of thing for your tea so that's where I discovered uh, comics uh, and you know they were all on display on the bottom shelf and we had all the time in the world to browse and uh, so me and my brother we used to buy every single comic going the dandy Beano, wizard and chips that kind of thing and we had a pile that was bigger than us and um, so because my parents were never around uh, we were kind of lonely and sad kids uh, but the characters in these comics uh, became kind of like familiar friends. They were like a real comfort. And they were dead funny, which is just what sad kids need when, when there's like joy and humour, like lacking in your life. So that's why humour is a really important part of my writing now. So, um, you know, they took my mind off all my worries. And, and that's why I created Maddie because I remembered what comic books did for me. And I wanted to give this experience back to other kids. So Maddie, it uh, doesn't have any sort of deep, profound meanings or messages. They're just pure escapism. I mean, of course, reading for empathy is vital, but I also think kids should have time out to enjoy themselves as well and just be kids, you know, where they don't have to worry and be completely stress free. Smiling and laughing, you know, it makes you feel, really, it makes you feel at ease. And it helps people connect and it's also great for overall health as well as your mental health so in my maddie workshops i take kids through how to draw 
simple expressions and characters and comic strips. And I asked them to think about funny experiences that have happened in real life or, or made up ones scenarios and create a story using words and pictures. Because I think it's a real shame that as we get older, we detach from using pictures to express ourselves. And uh, which is why I thought that it was interesting that Helen just earlier was mentioning that the graphic novels and everything. So, um, I mean, just recently, a parent told me that her son absolutely loved reading picture books, but that when he got older, school started giving him chapter books that had no pictures in, and then he went off reading altogether. And, she, and my friend, she got a little bit worried about this actually. So I gave him a couple of my Maddie It books and he absolutely loves them. He, he's totally engrossed in them. So I think that these sort of heavily illustrated books are a really good way to kind of bridge that gap. And they're like a brilliant gateway for, for reluctant readers, especially because they're, they're easy and fun rather than daunting and, and just kind of full of words. So just to give you a little bit of a, um, a quick description about um, both of these books. So Maddie Yip, she's a mixed race, uh, working class, and uh, I kind of like base her a little bit on myself. Um, and interestingly, somebody actually brought up the fact that it's, it's, these books are actually a few books that actually call mum, ma'am, M-A-M instead of mum, which is, which is basically kind of like what, you know, most people, most kids up north call their mam. Um, so Guide to Life is about finding your talent and how that doesn't have to be something you've practiced for years for and got certificates for. Maddie finds out in the end that she's just simply good at making people laugh. Um, and again, it's, it's a little message to just not stress out about being perfect or successful in other people's eyes. And then this one here, which has just come out this year, um, Maddie, it's Guide to Holidays, is about how Maddie, Maddie goes to like huge lengths to go on the new roller coaster ride but when she eventually gets on it, it scares the heck out of her. So um, I guess it's it's all about how things aren't always what they're cracked up to be. Uh, and so really you're not missing out. So um, I think that, you know, if a book's taking you to your favourite place and you want to explore there again and again, then I think that's reading for pleasure doing its thing. OK, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Sue. Um, I'm from Wales, so I say ma'am as well. Um, so I, I, I'm very pleased to see that. But it's, it's fantastic what you're saying about, you know, um, just getting kids to enjoy, uh, you know, the fun of reading and kind of fun stories that will engage them, um, whatever interests them, um, just to get that kind of joy of reading going um, and comics and kind of joke books or kind of funny stuff uh, can, can often do that for, for reluctant readers. Uh, so thank you, Sue. Uh, so now to our, our next panellist. So Joe Bowers has worked in primary education for over 30 years, firstly as a primary school teacher and literacy leader leader in schools and then as a lecturer for literacy in primary education. She has co-led an Open University Reading for Pleasure teacher group for teachers in Wales and is a Wales representative for the UKLA. Um, over to you Jo. Thank you Emma and lovely to be here everybody and I'm just delighted to watching the chat come up and see where everybody's from actually so I must stop getting distracted now because I keep checking out where you're all from it's just lovely to see so many different places um, and I'm also from Wales um, Sue and Emma so I understand that ma'am thing so thank you for mentioning that but I'm here to talk a little bit about what to do after the re summer reading challenge so I'm assuming there's quite a few of you in the um, room today who have finished the summer reading challenge i.e you did it over the summer and you're ready and motivated inspired and want to keep that momentum going and spread the word and what to do next and there may be some of you who are thinking about starting it so hopefully i'll be offering some ideas of how to keep that momentum going a little bit later in the term when you finish doing yours as well and then what to find what to read next and how to do that as well and um, how to engage with the wider community of of book lovers around and about so i'm going to start first of all in thinking about what you do with your summer reading challenge knowledge and what you've gained and the books that you've read when you go back into your classrooms or the libraries where you're working and obviously the, I think the first thing that comes to mind is to share the books with your class 
with the children that you're working with and to use it as a reciprocal sharing. So with time for the children to share what they've been reading, some of the children may have been doing the summer reading challenge themselves. Actually, some of them may just be readers and they just read the books that they read and they, and they do it that way. But it's, I think it's really good to sort of set it up as that reciprocal, reciprocal kind of sharing. I mean, research has shown, and I think um, Helen talked a bit about this earlier, that teachers are one of the key role models to inspire children to read for pleasure and to become those lifelong readers. Um, so even if some of the children didn't have the opportunity to read or visit the libraries, we have to consider that as well over the summer. This could be the start for them of their class reading challenge. You could have your own mini sort of challenge of like developing it into a sort of micro session of that with with your class as well and you know you might want to create a display of the books that you've all read to celebrate favorites um, I'm sure if you're familiar well if you're not even familiar with the reading for pleasure website that the Open University have there's lots of good examples of practice one of which is the reading river which you might want to start so that you can develop it as the year goes on sort of keep adding to it your sort of favorites maybe have a book sharing table where you can go and put post-its on the books that you enjoyed and why you wanted it so it might entice somebody else in so start to share and have those initial conversations with the books that you've been reading because um, building your knowledge is what I found develops your confidence and your ability to make suggestions so the more you read the more you have knowledge of things you want to read uh, share with others and of course it, it, the fact of the matter still remains whether it's children's books or you know or adults literary books when you've read a good book the first thing you want to do when you finish reading it is tell somebody about it and you want to share it so I think you know you have that kind of captive audience with your class to do that and so you know by putting those recommendations out you may then encourage the children to start doing their own recommendations as well and in encourage sort of like if you like this book you might like that book and just build it up with time um, also about I think about thinking about the best way to use some of the books that you've read over the summer or that you're going to read if you're just about to start the summer reading ch reading challenge and how you could do them. So I think different books that you read lend themselves to different sort of social environments within the, the classroom um, and school and library environment, doesn't it? Um, so some books that you've read may be the perfect ones to read aloud. You might have been thinking, I really want to read this to somebody aloud because it's just so funny or it's got such great characters in it. So have those as a selection and set those aside and have a different conversation with those. Read the blurb on the back, have a vote, see which ones come out as the most popular and start that kind of reading aloud um, um, within your classroom just based on a kind of choosing one of the ones that you've read over the summer. Um, some of the books that you've read might support a theme or a topic. You know, you might have been reading some nonfiction you, or some poetry and it sort of fits in with a topic. And therefore, they might be a good starting stimulus to introduce your theme or your topic um, and give the children more time to explore those books by keeping those in the reading corner as well. Um, to, you might also want to... Um, explore the books in more depth as well so you have those kind of show and tell sharing favorites these are the books that I liked best kind of conversations which are so important but you might want to book the, do this in a bit more depth as well um, one again I'm going to refer to the teaching um, open university reading for pleasure website because there are so many examples of practice so it's really good to have a little explore around there if you've got a spare half an hour just dip in and see, see. but one of the ones I'm just going to mention is one that Ben Harris did about book blank Blankets. And that's a really good way of perhaps going into more depth about the books. So you might want to focus the children on maybe finding a book that you like from the appearance of the cover, maybe a book with an eye catching title, ask the children to explain to each other why. Um, you may want to find a book that makes you laugh. So you look at the front cover and you think that's got to be a funny book. I really like that. Um, and you may want to think find a book that actually it's got a subject that you're interested in. One of the things that's really good about this that I found is that this is one really good way of getting to know your individual reader preferences in your class. You'll see the children that are going towards graphic novels. You'll see the children that are going to the funny books. You'll see the children that like the picture books, the nonfiction picture books. And it's really good to think about are any asking the children, are any of these books surprising? So just for interest. And I find that I 
constantly am surprised by books, you know, so sometimes you make assumptions about what you're going to see. A book that came out recently that I read, it's called The Upside Down Detective Agency. This completely surprised me because I didn't really feel like I'd seen a picture book that actually offered a bit of kind of gra early graphic novel for really young readers. But at the same time, it offered that mystery solving that I really love in a book, those kind of mystery series uh, chapter books. And it kind of paves the way for your reader moving into those kinds of books when they're more independent readers as well. So it's looking at books that when you look inside them, how did that surprise you? Why did that surprise you as well? So also you might find within your classroom, you've got readers who want a bit more again. So maybe setting up a book club, and it may be that you find that your enthusiasm and passion is the same kind of enthusiasm and passion that's coming across in the, with some of the children, all of the children, but maybe some more than others. And they're a great place to explore books in more depth. One really good example of that is the Just Imagine Reading Gladiators uh, book club. So if you're not familiar with that, uh, Google uh, Just Imagine and look at Reading Gladiators. This is a free teacher's resource that's for the first time this is September. It's got so many books books from year two to year six, a whole range of genres and all the teacher notes to support the book club. So in a way, it's kind of there ready for you to start up and go. So I thought I must just add that in as a tip. It might be that, again, the other thing about what you do next is sharing your readings your, with your colleagues, because I don't know about you, but I find if I've got somebody to talk about things with, I feel like it's I, I kind of it develops it more for me. So it's about finding a community in the school and sharing what you're doing to entice others in. Again, I'm going to refer to one of the examples of practice, and this was by with one of the teachers that was part of the group that I co-led with a teacher in Wales, and they did um, a WhatsApp group because what they found was there was never any time in the day for the teachers to get together and it was never going to happen. And also then we went into lockdown. Um, so he, this was Gethin Wallace, he set up a WhatsApp group where he set up a mini book club and sent his recommendations and everything just went back and forth. And everybody started, they would then come into school with their books and swap them and share them with everybody and talk a bit more about them in school. So it's really worth thinking about how would it work for you? Would a book box in the staff room work? Is there time for informal staff room chat is there something more formal where you could have your own book club would that work so it's finding something that works in the context of the space that you're in as well and again engaging with that widening com community you might want um, to go and look onto the teachers reading for pleasure website for a teachers reader group in your area um, I know the teachers that have come to the group that I've led for since the beginning, since it started actually, and are still in the group and they're still good friends and they still geek together and they've got their own WhatsApp group, which I've kindly been invited to be part of, even though I'm not a teacher. Um, and we do things virtually as well now. Um, so I think, have a look at that. And I think that's another way of, again, engaging and keeping them, your enthusiasm going when you're tired and when there's things that are sort of more important and pressing and deadlines that you've got to do as well. I think teachers, you know, and librarians and, and readers in general inspire and support each other. And it, it also encourages us to find more um, books that we might not think of that are not the kind of choices that we would make as well. So those are some of the things about building on the challenges um, that you've done um, from the summer. Um, I also think another thing is about making time to read throughout the year. Another teacher friend of mine um, actually decided about, oh, I think it must have been a couple of years ago now that she was going to read for 15 to 20 minutes every day. Whatever happened, she was going to read and that's what she was going to do. The number of books she's read since then, and yes, she's read a bit more than 15 to 20 minutes many times. Of course, in the school holidays, you can do a bit more than that. But it has actually not just what and research has shown this. It's not, it's not just had an effect on her reading knowledge and her book, book knowledge and all the impact of the children within her class. It's also actually impacted on her well-being. And we did some research when I was um, at the university, working at the university, and the students fed back. It wasn't just about when they read children's books really good in their classroom. It brought a sense of calm. It brought a sense of excitement with the children. It actually built, built their confidence and their knowledge. They said at the end of the day, it actually helped them to relax as well. So I think that's another really good way of thinking about it in terms of actually what does it do for you as well? 
Um, so choosing text, it's basically how to find what to read next. I think I probably need to stop fairly short quickly. So I'm just going to say recommendations from the website, from the reading agency, from other book reviews is a great place to go. Engaging with the website and looking at short lists and long lists on different children's book awards, because different book awards focus on different, different types of books. So you're going to have a whole range there. Um, engaging with the book community, maybe on Twitter. I know I've met some of my closest book friends uh, virtually on Twitter, and it's a really warm and supportive community um, and also joining organizations like the United Liter Kingdom Literacy Association again I found my book tribe there when I started teaching so many years ago and they're still part of my book um, DNA really and we're still in good contact um, so it's about having that kind of community and getting those recommendations of those people that are out there and I hope that's been some way of helping about what to do next from the challenge that's brilliant. Thank you, Joe. And like I say, it's so important to think about, um, you know, teacher well-being as well. Mm. Uh, so you're, you're supporting the, the children in, in your class, but also, you know, supporting your own well-being as well. Um, so thank you very much for that. You mentioned the Reading Agency website. Uh, we do always have loads of resources on there to follow along with the different book prizes. Um, so do, do have a look at that as well. So thank you for thank you for mentioning that. Um, so thank you for that, Joe. Um, last but not least, we're going to pass to our final panelist. So Elle McNichol is a best-selling children's author. Her debut novel, A Kind of Spark, was published in 2020 and won many awards. There it is. You can see a copy of the beautiful cover. Uh, it won many awards including the Waterstones Children's Book Prize and the Blue Peter Book Awards. Uh, and I know Elle's a regular visitor to schools and libraries all around the country. Uh, so over to you, Elle. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on today. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for everything everyone said so far. And actually a lot of it's covered things I was going to talk about. So that's really great. Um, first of all, being that reading for pleasure is just the only way to get uh, reluctant readers into reading that, that, that I believe from my experience in schools as an author. Um, but first I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why this book was written because it's kind of informs everything I do in my work now. But um, when I was a, a sort of the age that my readers are, so 9 to 12 from that, that time, I was a sort of uh, a librarian's dream, I, I, I like to think. I really was an independent reader, loved reading, read, uh, was starting to read adult texts, you know, was really, really um, a, a good reader, not someone that people were worried about. But what happened, unfortunately, and what, sorry, excuse me, we've got builders in, um, what happened, um, unfortunately, was that because I am a, a disabled person, I'm autistic and I have learning difficulties, um, a lot of my teachers very well-meaningly tried to steer me towards books that were representative or what they thought were representative. And that's that's what we should be doing. We should be um, letting marginalized kids, whether it's because of their race or their background or their, um, their disability, we should be offering them texts that uh, affirm their identity and, and represent them. Unfortunately, in the uh, early noughties, the books about disability in the children's world were very, very limited. And they were very, very specific in the way that they dealt with disability. They were almost always written by non-disabled people and they treated disability like um, this sort of terrible curse <laughs> that was put onto you and they were usually cured by the end of the book which is a really toxic thing to read about when you're um, a disabled child and I would I, my love of reading started to dim when these books were being given to me and, and the same narratives were being told again and again um, and I would look at these well-meaning teachers and librarians and go oh is that what people think of me do they really think that I should be cured do they really think that um, that I want to die you know a lot of those books a lot of these characters these books I remember they would talk about wanting to die and I just remember thinking should I feel that way um, and everything started to dim and get a little bit I, I stopped loving reading as much and um, and then when I became you know when I was older and I was working in publishing the first thing I said when I was in editorial meetings I said I think we need to change the way we tell stories about disability in children's books and uh, I was laughed out of many rooms they thought that was ridiculous they said no disability doesn't sell no Nobody's interested in disability, um, booksellers don't care, <laughs> foreign publishers don't care, and schools don't care. They said schools only want non-fiction texts about disability. And I said, no, I, I, I really strongly disagree. I remember being the, the keenest reader. I remember just absolutely adoring fiction and then being put off it by texts that really um, marginalized disabled children further. And I went into non-fiction reading and so I really think there's a market for for disability representation in children's books that is representative authentic fun um 
that's got agency where there's no toxic cure narratives all of these things I said to publishers and they said no no that's there's no market for it um that's a few years ago now and luckily I don't have to defend myself anymore M my books are bestsellers so I get to sort of hold them up and say no you were wrong um and the best part is I now get to go into so many schools and libraries and meet incredible teachers and librarians who love having my books to give to the kids that were like me and also to the reluctant readers you know a lot of uh, kids with ADHD um struggle with reading sometimes um they either hyper fixate and focus on a book and finish it in a day or they have trouble getting into it um and what is so great is getting feedback saying that reluctant readers are really enjoying it because there's a lot of fat cut out of the story um so it's just thinking of ways to offer texts that are diverse and representative we talked a lot about diversity today and what i would love to say is that i'm not going to talk for too much longer because i've taken up five minutes but um diversity texts um whether they're by um uh, diverse you know diverse authors because of again their different races different um sexualities different backgrounds different religions or disability diverse texts they can't be treated like educational um work books they can't be sort of given to uh diverse children and given to marginalized children and said here here's a little uh here's a little resource book no they're stories they're fun they're if you learn something that's great but their real purpose is to be fun and affirming and engaging and I only think own voices authors are doing that right now in the industry so my plea today is just to say please make sure that there's books about disabled children in the library, please make sure that they're in the classrooms, please make sure that they are um, authentic and that they are positive and not, they don't have to be positive all the time, but they, that we, we don't wanna see any more sort of narratives about being cured or narratives about um, how awful it is because these are real children and they're, they're, they're inheriting these messages. And it's, it's the one thing I will say before I stop talking is that diversity is talked a lot about in the book industry, but disability is always left out people always forget about disability it's one in five children and it's incredibly important that they have stories that are fun and representative and available to them as well so thank you so much for letting me rant about that <laughs> that was a pleasure thank you Al. Uh, you've got lots of people agreeing with you in in the chat as well um like i say really important to not not just have those representations of disability but they are um, really positive ones uh, for for all children to read uh, and and um yeah see, see those things in a, in a really positive light uh, for, for all children so thank you uh, and lots of fans of, of like a charm uh, in in the chat as well um so thank you thank you to Elle and all of our panelists uh, it was fantastic to hear about your experiences and your recommendations for our audience um we're going to move to our audience questions shortly so if you have uh, questions everyone uh, for our panel please do put them into the Q&A function uh, and we will get through as many as we possibly can uh, before we move to that question I'll ask all of our panelists to, to rejoin us uh, with their their cameras on if that's all right um thank you lovely to see you all, all together now um, so before we move to our, our audience questions, I just wanted to put a question uh, out to all of you, and some of you have touched on this already, but how can people watching today create a real community of readers, um, and that could be in their school or in their library or, or some other setting, uh, how, how do they go about doing that? Jo, if I, maybe if I come to you first, uh, you touched on a few ideas earlier, but what, what do you think? Yeah, I was trying to think how to, to not reiterate what I've just said, but I suppose bringing it all together, I mean, the first thing I'd say is just continue to read. So the more you read, the more you want to read, and the more you, you build that sort of like uh, uh, passion around you of like of, of wanting others to, to read as well and sharing what you, you've got and building on your knowledge. But I think it's creating that strong environment, those strong social reading environments in your school. And those can be um, environments of reading aloud, um, independent reading, you know, all those things that 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 the the uh, teacher Teresa Kremen and the group's uh, research has shown. Um, you know, the idea is if we have readers who uh, teachers who read and readers who teach, we're going to develop those children who want to read for pleasure and become lifelong readers. Um, and it's making sure as well that you have that diverse, inclusive, and wide range of books within your classroom, because we want to reflect 
every reader in the classroom. And you can never know what a child is going to like. So we can't make those assumptions. So I would always say to make sure you keep reassessing as much as your budget allows you to, to keep reassessing your books and seeing what you've got and matching those against the readers. Because every year is a new group of children, isn't it? With a new preferences. Um, so it's having those things as well. And the other thing I would sort of um, say as well is, is, well, the other thing was children having agency. The idea that they have control over the choice of what they want to read and nothing that they read is off off topic really off bounds in terms of you know some children just love you were talking about that earlier sue that children love you know you love comics you know so have those kinds of reading materials in your classroom and encourage the children to feel that they can be shared with everybody as well um, and making time and space I think personally, making time and space for anything you love to do is one of the most important things you can do in life, really. And uh, therefore, making time to, for, and space for books. Um, but all those ideas aside, try not to do everything at once. Because that's the other thing as a teacher, you can feel overwhelmed. So I don't really want anybody to go away today with all these ideas and thinking it's just too much. I've got too much to do anyway. It's a busy term. I can't do any of that. What we found with the teachers reading for pleasure group was actually the teachers really honed in and focused on one thing that was really important to them that they wanted to develop. So it's starting small. It's starting with one thing. And it might just be that you decide this term. I want to read aloud every day. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that and I'm going to do that. And it's actually how you then build out when you start small and, and, and build on those things, I think. So those are just some of the things that came to mind. I was jotting down as I was talking. Thank you, Jo. Uh, and Elle, I know you, you you said you visit lots of schools and libraries. What sort of um, kind of positive things have you seen uh, sort of getting that community of readers going? Oh, well, two things I really think about a lot is, um, first of all, is reading buddies or older children who are uh, role modeling reading. Um, young children are very um, fascinated and, and fixated on what their peers who are older than them are doing. So if they see an older child, if it's a primary school, then it's a year six child, or if it's a senior school, maybe it's a sixth former or a year 11 child. But if they come in and talk about what they're loving to read, what they, you know, if they demonstrate a love for reading, those younger children are are, I feel 10 times more likely to want to do it because they've seen a role model do it um, rather than just being told you should read, it's good for you. Um, I think it's great to treat books, not to treat books like they're vegetables. Um, we don't want to sort of shove them <laughs> into children's mouths and go, it's good for you. We want them to sort of get excited. And, um, and second of all, I found that um, children who get involved in um, votes and uh, book school prizes, this has been touched on a little bit, but um, as an author, you, you get invited to a lot of schools who've nominated your book in a prize. And they're very surreal things to attend because the children are the judges and they're very intense. And they've, but they've been empowered by this process of, um, of discussion. And also they've been empowered by being allowed to say when they don't like something and why they don't like it. And they don't have to treat every book like it's in this ivory tower and it must be cherished. They're allowed to say, well, actually I thought this part was rubbish um so i think empowering them to have a voice within the the um the library which we've discussed already today but that's great and also when they see people who love to read rather than being told they should love to read it makes a huge difference and those older children have an enormous uh, amount of power over what the younger ones think yeah absolutely i totally agree i think teenagers are always going to be far far cooler aren't they than any grown-ups telling you telling you the best things to read uh, so yeah i really really like that idea um so if i if i come to you what, what do you think sort of inspires people to kind of get involved in a, a reading community oh i mean i was just thinking about how what i was like when i was at school and i was i was terribly shy and uh you wouldn't think it these days but anyway so uh, i just think that going back to basics going to the library what about you know introducing everybody to the library and taking them on a tour and then showing them like where everything is because I was very reluctant to actually go into anywhere it's like when you're an adult and you decide to go to the gym and you're like it's such a scary daunting place isn't it you don't know where anything is and you need a tour you need everyone to show you where the locker room is and where you get changed and all this kind of thing and then once you're familiar with it you're more likely then to go back again for repeat visits um and I think that maybe you know, maybe um, a book of the week or uh, a month or the month or something like that. Um, uh, 
no, no, what I was going to say was categorised by genre so that like when um, a child goes into the library, rather than alphabetical order, they can go straight to the thing that's going to interest them the most, like, you know, your funny books or your fantasy books or something like that. So maybe every week you get a box uh, or boxes that are, you know, categorised in that certain way, in those certain ways so that you can go straight to that place without actually needing to ask because a lot of kids are afraid to or a bit shy to, you know. Um, and I also think that, I don't know if you've seen those whiteboards when you go to the Tube in London and they've got like quote of the week uh, or, you know, something yeah. like that. And I just think maybe something like that at the library entrance, just kind of luring them in, you know, um, just something that's kind of like a little bit of a tidbit for them to, to be interested in. No, I really like that idea. And Deborah on the chat said she's going to steal your gym analogy because that's a, a brilliant one. <laughs> uh, Helen, I'll come to you now. What, what do you think? How do you recreate? Oh, there are so many, so many great ideas in there already. Um, I think a couple of things are, are almost what to think about not doing. So one of the challenges for teachers is we're so used to asking questions about stuff and wanting to know the answer and wanting to check if children have understood something. So I think in a teaching capacity, make a bit of space to really listen and to talk personally about yourself as a reader. So you know that they maybe think you sleep under the desk or in the cupboard, you know, that you're, they're not really sure about you as a human outside of school. So that really personal, you know, I read this on, uh, on my holiday or this is a you know a, a picture of me reading it to my children or whatever it might be um, starts to break down those barriers so that it's not reading um, in a, a kind of a teacher testing a checking on what they whether they're getting it right and it's not got those barriers for the children so that space to listen and be your authentic self to build a community around you um, I think one of the things we can do is show everybody that we're a reader um, and so that can be little things like having a, a display of what you've read so things like the poster that um, Emma was talking about earlier that comes with the teacher's reading challenge or a little shelf of what you're reading right now or even just carrying a book around with you um, because you kind of want the chat to be incidental and relaxed and oh you know um, oh my teacher seems to be carrying something or I don't know if librarians normally do this but you know maybe the librarians want to have a little um, thing about their favourite reads um, up in the library to start some chat going with people coming in and out of the library that could be lovely I'm sure some of you are doing that already um, and also um, thinking about I really agreed with both Ellen and um, Sue's suggestions that the book buddies um, and I know Emma was talking about adolescents being really cool but we've seen some massive success with older children in primary talking to the younger children choosing books to read with them um, and also like are getting their choices so that freedom that volition from the children is key um, to building that community but the last thing to avoid I guess and thinking really positively is we want to show everybody that we're readers and we want to be involved in this community but it's not about window dressing so you don't have to have the biggest budget you don't have to have the best bean bags or the swankiest display. Um, you could have got your books from a charity shop. They could have been donated. You could have a small collection um, available, but something that's nice, that's um, as uh, I think it was Sue was saying, around a genre or a theme or something that sparks interest um, to just get that conversation going and show that it's a real authentic thing, not about um, having the, the prettiest environment because that's not the bit that actually makes all the difference. So. Have some thoughts from me. Thank you. I see Myrie in the chat said um, they started a shelf of what they've read over the summer while Lovely. doing the Teachers Reading Challenge. So that's a perfect example of what we were talking about. Um, and I can see just thinking about that reading community, we've got a question on the QA from Rachel um, thinking about that wider community. So, do you have any ideas for getting parents on board? Um, uh, you know, the, the staff at the school are great, but our children don't maybe read at home that much. Um, any, any ideas for kind of getting um, parents involved? Helen, um, any, any sort of thoughts giving you on that? Okay, well, there's some suggestions on the OURFP website for that, for supporting parents at home. And one of the things to do is to open up those conversations because parents often think that reading is about phonics and having to listen to the book that's come home from school. And you want to turn that conversation on its head and say, what do you read at home? And parents might think they don't read at home, but 
they are reading a takeaway menu, they are reading their phone, they are reading the so a sign or something on the internet. So getting that chat um, is one of the first uh, steps to finding out about, you know, the children might want to read um, uh, auto trader weekly because that's what their dad or their mum reads at home or somebody else in the family or their big brother whatever um, but unless you break down those barriers and have that conversation about what stuff's going on in the home um, you can't really expect parents to join you um, if you're just telling them what to do and I'm not suggesting you are but that's just a, um, a, a common problem that happens in schools because we're all so busy and trying to help. Thank you, thank you Helen. Um, yeah, any other thoughts from the, the rest of the panel on how you can get sort of uh, parents and grandparents involved? Um, jo, I don't know if, you, if you've got any thoughts on that. Yeah, I once worked in a school. I wasn't actually a teacher there, but I was working with the school and they had regular book cafes where they would actually have them on a, not weekly, but maybe half to only basis. And then some of the favorite books that they've been reading, they would get out and sort of have, and they literally would have food and drink as well, and then invite the parents in and they would share the books that they've been reading. So it's bringing the parents and the children and the books together all in one place. And that really worked well. Brilliant. That's, that sounds fantastic. Um, so I'm just having a little look at our other questions uh, that have come in. There's an interesting one coming from Bethan about um, how do you see the role of public libraries in supporting reading for pleasure in schools? Um, I mean, just if, if I can kind of cut in there from uh, the reading agency perspective, obviously our, our big summer reading challenge uh, for children takes place over the summer. And we see a really strong correlation in areas where um, library services work really closely with their schools. We see, you know, much greater mm -hmm. participation, much greater engagement with the children. They're often completing the challenge, uh, you know, so a lot more than in other areas. Um, so I think when when public libraries can can work with their schools, um, that can that can only be a really really positive thing. I don't know if anyone else on the panel wants to talk about public libraries and how they can can support. I can, I can say something and it links a little bit, I think, to what Sue was saying earlier. Um, I've been um, involved in a project, uh, a piece of research at the moment with some organisations in London who are working to support um, reading for pleasure and writing for pleasure. And um, one of the things that's going on is this brilliant partnership between local schools in one borough and um, and public libraries. And I was lucky enough to go to an event where the library had put on a special event that themed with the curric a curriculum area that the school was working on. And they planned it together, you know, they had a conversation, they'd arranged the children's areas, so they'd got the right stuff out, they'd got activities, the whole event for them. And the school brought their, you know, one of the, the key classes over to the library to have an event in the library, which wasn't just about saying, here's the library, have a look around. It was actually something to do with their curriculum and it was fun and it was exciting, mm -hmm. but they were in the space. And so one of the things was then they had a little word afterwards about how you're allowed to come here. You could come here after school if you want. You could come here with your friends. Um, you know, you can get your own library card and you can take stuff out. So it was introducing children to the library for the first time, uh, many of them, but in this really positive way and supporting the curriculum, because obviously teachers timetables are crammed. Uh, you know, they've got to find a space where they can justify this time. And we know how important it is, but teachers might be worried about it. So seeing that link had really helped. Um, uh, that was a wonderful way that the, the local libraries, the public libraries were working with schools in that borough. Mm. I've seen um, lovely local li library near me where they've, and this is one thing that I hasn't been mentioned, we need to because of these wonderful authors we've got with us today. Children love to engage with the authors. Um, it's an absolute treat. I'm sure Elle and Sue, you're, you must find it just a joy to meet the children who read your books. And I've seen local libraries bring the author in and invite the schools in to do that. And when you bring all those things together, the book, the author, the library, the school, I think you've got the perfect um, situation, haven't you? So that's lovely when you see that, that happening. Yeah, yeah, Ellen, Sue, do you, do you want to sort of come in at that point? What's it like to, to meet those enthusiastic children who love your book so much? 
It's the best thing in the world, um, especially if they've, it's the first book they've ever read or it's the first time they felt represented. It's, it's hugely empowering. And yet when it feels like a community effort, when the teachers have been involved, when the librarians have been involved, sometimes even the parents have been involved. Yeah, it feels it feels like we're toppling something that's kind of unnamed and scary and we're doing something really um, life changing. So it's it's incredible. They really they, they love being able to grill authors in person. Like if they've been reading the book, then it's even better. Then they can just hound you with questions. Yeah. But also, I think that, you know, you've got a lot of kids. Um, that are there with you who you know you can sense that you know they're they're the ones that are unfamiliar with this kind of world of reading and you know that they're the reluctant readers they're the ones that are a little bit more shy and afraid to kind of join in and so I think it's really rewarding to actually get them on board and them kind of be interested in the whole um field of of, of reading and drawing and comic workshops and all that kind of thing and that's um yeah and when, when you see that happening I think that's that's a really that's a really lovely thing to say. Since you mentioned that earlier too about you know children drawing and writing their own stuff as well um, and that's just a, such a nice thing to do alongside their, their reading for pleasure getting them creating things. Yeah especially when they're not like uh, the most academic either like um, you know if, if writing and reading is not their thing but drawing always is because you know we all start off drawing at infant school that's the first thing that we learn um, and then later on we kind of like lose that um, but I always I even you know I even say to them you know which of you kids think that you can't draw and I always get a few that put their hands up and I'll say to them look I'm, I, I'm, I'm absolutely refusing to believe that and I've got this t-shirt where it's just two dots and a line it's basically just a smiley face and I say to them look you know everyone knows what this means it's a universal communication for everybody and you don't even have to speak the same language but drawing is the same language so everyone can understand uh, you know just a few lines put on the page and so I think that, you know, I think it's always important to have that drawing aspect as well to the writing so that we don't lose both of those together. Thank you, Sue. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, I can see in the chat, um, we've got Emma from Cheatham Academy in Manchester. Uh, thanks for your comment, Emma. Um, how would you suggest supporting disadvantaged boys to engage in reading? In our school, we have a clear boy-girl divide in our data with boys underperforming. Um, would any, Helen, would you like to... to yeah, I was waving at you because I'd seen Emma's question and I got all excited. So I, I don't have all the answers, Emma, but one of the things we found in our work with teachers, we've just actually been working on a new book, which has got just come out, I think last week, which has got case studies from teachers working on different elements of reading for pleasure in their classrooms. And one of the teachers made an effort to investigate that specific challenge in their classroom. And what they found was... Um, that they needed to understand much more about what the boys and the girls were reading because we come to it with such gendered expectations that we might think, oh, the boys want. It's very much like what Sue was saying about um, and somebody else in the chat about we think the boys might want comics or they might want um, particular types of books. And um, so they spent some time before they did anything, actually just um, working with the boys, finding out what they were interested in, looking at what they read and the girls as well. And they discovered that they were getting really subtle messages about was and what was and what wasn't for the, for them, um, which were negative for both the girls and the boys, not just the boys, um, because they were sort of pigeonholing them by accident in, into particular genre and um, choices. So, so my first tip is, talk to them watch them and one of the wonderful things that joe was talking about was using those book blankets so getting some selection of different books and texts and having an opportunity to browse and discuss and really actually listen um, to find out what they're interested in and you could do that of a sample in each class um, across your school and start to get a bigger picture because what you might find is those it's not that those boys don't like reading but it's that what's been put in front of them they think isn't for them um, or even the way that they're allowed to read maybe reading at, at the moment is timetabled in a particular way or the space in the classroom is used in a particular way that they're not um, finding exciting the social motivation for boys has been uh, I mean I think it's good for everybody uh, adults included but um, again we've had some brilliant case studies of boys reading 
um, something they're all excited by together and encouraging each other with that positive peer influence. So finding social ways to encourage reading for them could also be really useful. Sorry, I've gone on too long. No, no, that's, really, that's really, really helpful. And I think it, it taps into what Elle was saying earlier, you know, children will be really honest about what they like and don't like if they're given that opportunity uh, to, to talk about things. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time. That's gone so quickly. Um, I think we could talk about this all, all afternoon, couldn't we? Um, uh, a huge thank you to all of our panellists uh, for joining us this afternoon. Helen, Joe, Sue and Elle, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you all. Uh, a massive thank you to our audience. Uh, I really hope you've enjoyed the event and thank you for your brilliant questions. Uh, a short audience survey will be sent to you after the session so please do take some time to complete that for us if you can. Um, my colleagues just put a link uh, in the chat for you. We've got some other exciting uh, events happening soon uh, that you might want to sign up for. Uh, so do check those out. Uh, so remember to sign up for the Teachers Reading Challenge if you haven't already. And for everyone joining us from schools, uh, we hope you all have a brilliant autumn term. Uh, thank you, everyone, and goodbye.